Hey everybody, uh, thanks uh, for joining us for our next talk, uh, Capital One Uses Dask by Dan. Uh, not surprisingly, Dan works for Capital One, uh, is on the team dedicated to enabling accelerating computing using Dask in the PyData ecosystem. Uh, and I'll add, uh, not only that, he's got some awesome BFACs that if you want to see, please uh, check out the lightning talks from yesterday. Um, but that all said, uh, let me hand over to Dan. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, this talk is entitled Capital One Uses Dask! Exclamation point. And it's named that way because uh, when they solicited for talks, they said, make it exciting. So what better way? Uh, like I said, my name is Dan Kerrigan. I'm a software engineer at Capital One. I work in the C4ML department, that's Center for Machine Learning, on a team called uh, Machine or ML Tools, devoted to accelerating machine learning within Capital One. Uh, let's see. All right, today we're going to talk about a little about Capital One, my employer, uh, Dask usage at Capital One, the libraries and ecosystem that we use, the, our deployment and uh, infrastructure strategies, the user experience for users of Dask challenges, and uh, finally, the future of where we're going. So Capital One Financial Services, you may know, we offer credit cards, uh, auto loans and services, banking and customer services. And by customer services, I'm speaking um, of things like Eno, which is a recommendation engine that's based on your shopping needs. So you can uh, start to see where machine learning would come in there. And also of course, call centers and there's a system for combating fraud with virtual card numbers. Uh, some other applications for statistical learning and machine learning at Capital One. Uh, under fraud, you know, you wanna only authorize charges to happen on your behalf. Uh, we Identity theft is a big problem today. First party fraud, just meaning uh, individuals uh, trying to defraud Capital One. Uh, networks of fraud, of course, money laundering, uh, and much more. There are many ways to perpetrate fraud, right? And uh, machine learning and statistical learning is also used to assess risk, not only financial uh, when delivering products or assessing how much money it should cost to acquire a customer, but also uh, the risk that someone will be delinquent on payments or even just decide to disappear into the ether. Machine learning is used in customer service. Uh, there's recommendations, product recommendations uh, that end up being mailing or advertising, um, voice transcription and sentiment analysis, especially like in the call center context. And in information technology, we have anomaly detection um, for data access and probably Anomaly detection can be spread across the other categories too. Uh, data loss prevention, we have heavily segmented data that we try to protect. It's um, personally identifiable information of financial data, it needs to be protected. Uh, we guard against unauthorized access to our systems. We have chatbots that uh, help internal and external users and much more. So uh, who's using Dask in Capital One? model developers and data scientists, obviously. And um, just anecdotally, I think that they mostly use higher level collections such as data frames and arrays. Um, the quants and applied mathematicians tend to convert equations directly to Python code using data frames uh, semantics. They have a lot of familiarity with R usually, and they come with R expectations. Uh, along the way, they'll pick up other tools like pandas or stats models, NumPy, pandas, and scikit-learn. <laughs> Newer data scientists tend to already be familiar with NumPy and pandas. Uh, and experienced data scientists um, are familiar with a, a very wide range of tools and tend to make decisions based on the technology stack that's available to them. And we'll talk a little bit about that more. Um, the next category, broad category, is tooling developers and integrators. Uh, these high level collections, like everyone else, but also start uh, getting into the, using lower level constructs, including job lib. Um, and then finally, well, um, oh, it, integrators are much more concerned about deployment and making that easy. Our last category is, would be analysts, they're end users. Um, where a desk is running behind the scenes and they might not necessarily be starting their own clusters to run analyses that will have been abstracted away from them. 
So why Dask? And this particular picture comes from the Dask tutorial that illustrates the problem. Um, basically scaling and a success story for Dask. Dask succeeds at enabling Capital One to scale the computation, both in terms of uh, size and speed. So that's great. Uh, but why do we do it computationally? Uh, for experiments, uh, if we can uh, eliminate more features or um, do more experiments with feature elimination or larger grid searches, then uh, hopefully we'll get to a better result. That area under the curve will be a little bit bigger. Uh, and for data size, same, that if we can parallelize our data access, we can read it faster. If we can process more data, um, we can run a more comprehensive experiment. And then uh, also why Dask for scaling is resource availability constraints. Typically for larger data problems at Capital One, users will choose the largest AWS instance available to them. Well, AWS doesn't have as many uh, X1E as they do T2 micros available. It tends to be a, a limited resource. So in the middle of the day, when everyone's trying to do their data science, they just aren't there. And also scaling memory. We have larger than memory data sets. Uh, our users tend to join uh, large data sets um, leading to Cartesian explosions of data. Uh, there's some resistance to sampling depending on the team for these large data sets. And part of that is because they don't want to introduce bias in the sampling approach. And also, if you can process all of the data and you can afford it, why wouldn't you? Um, and then more availability constraints. The, those large memory instances are a limited resource on Capital One or uh, in AWS. So another wide ask slide here. Uh, it's the Pi data ecosystem. Data science code is commonly written in Python. It's not the only option, but it's very popular. Jupyter is a great user interface for your average data scientist or even great data scientist. Uh, and then the Pandas library and data frames are great. Scikit-learn has a, a lot of machine learning algorithms that are popular and it's extensible, right? Uh, Capital One uses several of these things. And we introduce our own code kind of at that top level. We, uh, my own team has a library called Particles that builds on top of the scikit-learn API and takes advantage of everything in the stack. Were it not for PyData, our library wouldn't be possible. <clears throat> okay, so uh, what are some specific things that Capital One uses? Uh, within Dask, data frame and array are by far the most common uh, pieces that get used. Uh, there's quite a bit of usage of the distributed uh, part of Dask. And of course, all of the deployment libraries. So there's Dask Kubernetes, very popular for users who have access to Kubernetes at a lower level. Uh, same with the Dask Helm chart, Dask gateways used to give users their own Dask cluster in a managed way. And Dask Yarn, um, although it's not used as much, there's still a large spark footprint within Capital One and teams that are used to the uh, operation or operating of EMR clusters have utilized Dask Yarn. And then uh, some other very popular libraries, Scikit-Learn, XGBoost, Holoviews, Intake, RubeCon, um, and our own li library, Particles, although there are very many, many more. Uh, how does Capital One deploy Dask? Well, we'll talk about two categories here, infrastructure tooling and configuration tooling. Um, there are limited options available within Capital One for platforms. We're cloud first, we're all in on AWS. We have no physical data centers. Um, the, what's available to users are Kubernetes on EC2 and ECS, Bargate and SageMaker, uh, EKS are not available. So that, that kind of limits what's, uh, what you can deploy to. Dask Yarn, like I mentioned before, is popular for teams that still are EMR oriented. Dask Helm Chart and Dask Kubernetes are very popular among teams with low level access to Kubernetes. Um, 
think not analysts. They'll be like teams developing systems or teams with heavy DevOps experience. And then DAS Gateway has also been developed or deployed as a solution for high level user specific DAS cluster deployments. And that avoids the need for the low level AWS and uh, Kubernetes experience and also just obtaining credentials for those things. We guard our cloud resources very tightly, as you can imagine. And then uh, for configuration, we use Terraform and CloudFormation, Docker for creating images, Conda for creating uh, Python environments, Helm charts and Kubernetes manifest for Kubernetes things, and more shell scripts in Python than you can probably imagine. Or maybe you can, but there's a lot of it. So the user experience um, here at Capital One is mostly centered on notebooks, I would say, for the average user. Advanced users still write Python and you know, execute them as you would expect. Uh, but they can be user deployed with Helm charts or Kubernetes manifests. Um, Capital One has heavily segmented data access. So you always have to deploy into the environment where the data exists. Uh, that makes kind of cross enterprise uh, systems not as easy to manage or deploy. Uh, there are Kubeflow is another way that uh, are a common way that notebooks are spawned that eventually spawn Dask. And then uh, local environments, of course. One of the great aspects of Dask is that it can be run locally or in the cloud. Uh, the only caveat is that local environments, uh, uh, meaning an individual's workstation, has limited access to production data, um, and probably not at all. It's usually through a web interface that anyone gets to interact with that data. Uh, and another note that Capital One has some internal systems that I'll only allude to that allow users to spawn notebooks and desk systems. Uh, we also have ways to batch execute things that happen to use Dask. There's Kubeflow again, uh, Prefect as a workflow manager, although it's abstracted. We don't have like an enterprise version of Prefect uh, running internally. And once again, internal systems that happen to execute Dask as a service. The, it would be the backend computation engine for some model. And then, uh, I thought it's interesting, this last note, ad hoc execution. Teams with significant DevOps expertise and resourcefulness are a little more empowered to make their own way when deploying Dask. In our own team, we've deployed Dask using um, just on plain EC2 and on ECS and with Dask Gateway. Uh, we have the access and the ability to do those things to create prototypes, and so we've done so, and we're not the only ones. Some challenges um, for infrastructure, ad hoc infrastructure is not available for most users, uh, specifically analysts or the people who would take a trained model and run it on new data. Um, right sizing cluster resources is very, it's not easy. There are some rules of thumb. I heard yesterday that uh, Krishan uses, he'll size his clusters at I guess 10 times his data size. Uh, it's a good rule of thumb, but it, it might not be as efficient as it could be sometimes. And uh, it might not be enough in others. It's hard to say. So uh, core or compute cores, we don't worry about so much. Memory usage is constantly an issue. Uh, disk IO at Capital One is, um, I would say it's not something that your average data scientist uh, thinks about IOPS for disk when something spills to disk. And they might not be aware of the uh, semantics for spilling to disk or when you what happens when you run out of memory. All they know is that a computation is going very slow. And their first attempt to optimize would be to look at the performance of their data frame code, not necessarily that there's an underlying issue with memory usage. Uh, GPU usage requires an even deeper familiarity with the uh, underlying data physics, uh, compute environments, the images, the node layout and disk and network IOPS, uh, and more are rarely optimized for distributed computing patterns here at Capital One. Um, it's not that we 
can't do it, but the it's not the teams that deploy systems are the same ones that run workloads often. Um, there are also too many and still too few options, depending on. Um, oh well, so Capital One is partitioned by lines of business. Um, there are shared resource or shared solutions across lines of businesses that aren't generally available. So one line of business can't access another line of businesses compute resources uh, currently. And um, an example of too many options are some lines have the ability to deploy directly to Kubernetes with minimal constraints. That means that the world's kind of your oyster. You can deploy anything you'd like. And then other lines only have access to a notebook server with tightly controlled images, um, even Python environments and batch deployment uh, system for model serving. Let's see, our next challenge is education. So uh, for base knowledge, there's general task, what to do, what not to do. Um, an example would be avoiding shuffling, scaling patterns for pandas to dask, it's tempting just to replace um, pd.dataframe with dd.dataframe, but there are many you know, issues like iloc not being there. Uh, interpreting it, uh, executing task graph. Um, although there's some documentation for this, um, most users just are still clueless. So um, task retries and failures, communication, memory pressure are all things that you need to kind of operate in executing task graph and kind of interpret the, um, interpret that graphic and kind of try to decide what's happening in your executing model. It's not always clear to someone who's just written some code that they thought would execute like it does in pandas as it would in Dask. And then to see uh, jobs failing and retrying, they, they're kind of at square one when it comes to troubleshooting that. So um, our next obstacle would be internal training. Um, lots of great tutorials exist, but even better would be specific training, help, uh, helpful for applications that are specific to uh, Capital One generalities. And that would be grouping and joining large data sets, scaling data access, scaling software development. And on that front, um, Andrew and Ryan presented um, the building libraries with scikit-learn as a way to scale software development. Uh, we've had some success with that, and we'd like to bring it to more of Capital One. Uh, machine learning specific considerations, the availability of certain algorithms and, and their scaling. Uh, uh, a big area for this would be, or a good example would be an XGBoost, not all um, not all metrics are available in a distributed context, but a model will be developed uh, before, without considering scaling, they'll use a metric that's not available with the distributed algorithm. So when it comes to go to production, then they have to um, reassess some assumptions that they made about the performance of a model. And then data access that's specific to our common data stores and systems. So we operate Snowflake and we have S3, uh, like everyone else, else on AWS, there's data generated by other systems and SQL databases. Uh, tutorials tend not to focus on that sort of thing. Uh, educating users about data best practices in the area of data engineering in data access, indexing and partitioning and when you would uh, optimize for certain pattern or uh, certain data layouts, uh, the deployment of Dask clusters within our internal systems, cluster resource sizing and scalable model development are all uh, areas that we have work to do. Let's see, there's also education about distributed computing and compute, compute bound problems versus memory bound problems. Um, Dask tends to be an exciting new technology and people want to deploy it, deploy it for every context. But if the data fits in memory and they're not compute bound, then uh, we don't want them to get stuck on desk specific issues right away. 
There's also um, in an on a distributed system, and this is uh, would be good to point them to the talk yesterday. There are a lot of concerns. There's distribution of data, thinking ahead about distributed memory and the underlying data layout that Dask data frames provide, and uh, same with Dask arrays. The execution of the task graph that I alluded to earlier, and data sizing, partition sizing. Um, Task graphs get really big really fast when you have thousands of parquet partitions. Let's see. And our last challenge, or it'll never be the last, but the last one I'm going to talk about alternatives to Dask and PyData in uh, Capital One. Databricks has a large installed base, uh, as well as a Spark and PySpark. And I think there's a lot of successful projects that have used that, and people tend to carry institutional knowledge forward. They, if, so, if they've used something in the past and have been successful, they'll use it again and might not uh, try something new. So the future of Dask at Capital One, we have more education and training. Um, we're already teaching intro to Dask classes, rapids classes, uh, are, we have an internal education organization called Tech College, and they have introduced uh, monthly DAS training, and we hope to build on that. Uh, and in the future, we wanna introduce more advanced DAS usage course, uh, courses and um, more education around the internal tooling that's available to different users. Uh, for examples, we would like to focus on successful patterns of usage with data, uh, data access and um, distributed compute kind of informed examples. Uh, the next would be community building. We have support channels. Uh, we build pre give presentations uh, like the ones you've seen earlier this week uh, and connecting our users within Capital One with each other and building common experience and knowledge and uh, creating more documentation around best practices. The, uh, we also have a customer support success role where teams that are building using our internal tools or using Dask hopefully can come to us uh, in a customer success role where we help them with the concepts that are tricky or um, they happen to need help with. And that would be, can be anything from education to building out examples. And for implementation in Capital One, expanded Dask algorithm support and external libraries. We're already using uh, distributed versions of scikit-learn algorithms and Dask ML. Um, XGBoost and LightGBM are also very useful. Uh, the warm start, base margins, scoring, early stopping uh, have all been great. We hope to push more open source implementations from within Capital One. For example, alter, um, alternate elimination strategies and recursive feature elimination besides step-based. And uh, within Capital One, Kubernetes, Kubernetes, Kubernetes. We're Kubernetes first organization. Uh, we deploy plenty of things to AWS, but user workloads, it seems, will go toward Kubernetes even more. And we look for extensible solutions like Dask Gateway, Dask Kubernetes, uh, to be able to deploy within our organization. So a quick note, after yesterday's, well, uh, back to the keynote on Wednesday, which compared commonly used APIs like we have in arrays and scikit-learn to civil infrastructure like the electrical grid, um, that statement really resonated with me because in a practical way, that's exactly what my team is trying to make happen within Capital One. By using tooling from the PyData ecosystem, which is commonly designed with interoperable APIs, we construct solutions and develop models that are based on battle-tested libraries uh, without reinventing the wheel. Uh, where PyData allows us to build models faster, Dask allows us to run bigger models with more data that enables us to make better decisions faster than ever before. So thank you for attending this talk. We're hiring. Feel free to uh, visit Capital One's website or contact me directly. I'd appreciate it.
we'll take questions. Thanks, Dan. If folks have any questions, you can use the Q&A box. All right. If you have uh, any que any further questions, you can reach out to me on Slack. I'll, I, um, I'll be hanging out in the desk Slack. And I guess our contact information is out there. Oh, was there much, uh, much resistance to introducing Dask over Spark? Um, we don't enforce any technology stacks at Capital One. There are a variety of solutions available. Uh, some users that are heavily Spark invested or have heavy experience in Dask have resistance or uh, have experience with Spark, have resistance to using Dask and have a lot of questions. I would say the break really is if they're a PyData oriented team and Python oriented, then they don't have a problem with using Dask. If they're Java or Scala programmers, then yeah, they have a big problem with going to uh, Dask. Does that answer the question, John? Uh, okay. And Michael Sterling, uh, what do you think are the biggest impact training materials you've created? The introduction to DAS tutorial is really great for uh, for someone who's got no experience using DAS period. And so that's a great tutorial. We've given it several times. It's always well received. Part of the kind of value add that we give by giving it internally um, is that we're heavily desk experienced and can answer not only internal questions about desk, but lend our expertise of operating it within Capital One and the problems of other users. So um, we're looking forward to creating more material the other presentations we've given haven't been, they've been kind of more, um, uh, not ad slides, but we're advocating the usage of Desk more than training. But I think we're gonna get there. There's room for more material. Uh, Fabian asks, what is the size of a typical Desk cluster at Capital One? And did you experience any particular issues when scaling your clusters? Yes. Um, we tend to create clusters that fit the size of memory. So I guess some of the largest clusters that I personally deployed are, I guess, three over 300 nodes with around 24 gigabytes of memory a piece. The particular challenges are, even though we can deploy a cluster that large with Kubernetes easily and almost trivially, maybe too easily, is that, um, the, you still can't work with a very large task graph with Dask. In certain operations, I think um, Rick mentioned earlier that there are kind of some operations around Parquet where if you have thousands of Parquet partitions, it, there's still going to be like a single task at the end to write the uh, metadata. That means that there's like several thousand lines of communication to a single worker and the single worker can still be overwhelmed by uh, any given task. So that's that's one issue, one challenge. But infrastructure-wise, no, uh, Kubernetes and AWS have been great for elastic cluster sizes. FS asks, uh, what is indicative cost of running this Dask workload per month in AWS, um, on AWS at Capital One? I guess that's proprietary information. I can't disclose it, but there, and I wouldn't even be able to tell you, but um, because there are so many AWS users, isolating our particular usage is kind of above my 
pay grade. But the I will say that we've run experiments um, speaking to the success of Dask, where certain jobs or certain models would take weeks to train, and they kind of have to be babysat by a human just because they were limited in scale from running on a single node. And uh, by running them in Dask, they take far less time to run. So even though the compute resources would maybe break even, especially in the case of GPU usage for cost over time, um, it's reducing the amount of time that it takes to run a model. And because of that, we can run more experiments or there's less time monitoring a job for uh, problems and we save money that way. So overall, it's really hard to say what a model costs. Okay. I'll say, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah go thank on. you. Sorry. I was going to say, say yeah, uh, we're on AWS, so you can, um, our costs are not too dissimilar from everyone else's. Yeah, reach out on Slack if you have questions. Thank you. Thank you.